Hello, everyone. My name is John Neville with ESM Prep. My name is Robin Glover. I'm also a mentor with ESM Prep. And we are here to share with you the grammatical principles of the SAT and ACT. So to begin, our students consistently report that their biggest, fastest score increases come from learning the material that we are about to share with you today. This material comes from the writing and language section of the SAT and the English, the English section of the ACT. Two thirds of SAT writing and language questions are gonna be grammatical in nature. The other third are gonna be editing questions. And then half of the ACT English questions are grammatical, the other half will be editing. And it's not that this grammar and these principles are necessarily difficult or extraordinarily complex. It's just presented and tested on these tests in a different way than it tends to be done in schools and in school tests. Lastly, we, we are presenting 12 different categories of grammatical principles to you. And each grammar category is gonna have a distinct unique trick um, we're going to help you learn how to spot these kinds of questions so that you can learn to answer the question, what grammatical category is at play here and therefore what tip or technique do I need to utilize? The first question to ask yourself when faced with a grammar question is what category does it belong to? Um, so many questions, like so many students just dive into a question without stopping to ask themselves, um, is this question covering commas? Is it covering um, colons? Is it covering redundancy, right? There's all these different categories, verb tense, right? And your approach to the question is going to vary widely depending upon what is actually being tested. You wanna also take a close look at the answer choices because the differences in the answer choices is going to give you the information that you need in order to determine which category is at play. And we do recommend that you do whatever you can to really get down and understand and remember, recall the unique trick that belongs to each category. Lastly, we don't wanna go by sound. Too many students report saying, oh, this, this answer sounds the best or this answer sounds better than the others but we don't really wanna go by sound. Yes, there are a couple of exceptions, which we're gonna to discuss today, but rather than going by sound for the majority of questions, you wanna really absorb the grammatical mechanics that you're gonna learn from us today so that you can then cross off wrong answers with confidence. Okay, so we are gonna introduce some terms. We're gonna stay away for the most part from uh, you know, complex grammatical terms that you may have heard in English class, because quite frankly, they're just not necessary on the test. Um, but a few that you will need to know and that we'll be using are clause. So that's just a subject and a verb working together. And independent clause, which again, sounds kind of scary, but all it is is a complete thought or what we typically think of as a sentence. And then a dependent clause has a subject and a verb, but it can't stand alone. So it's something like if I start a sentence and I said, while I was walking, you can clearly hear that that's not a complete thought. That's all we mean by a dependent clause. And let's okay. also add, let's also add back in there the fanboys for and nor, but, or yet so. So you're going to hear us talk about and use the term fanboys. And that is a type of conjunction that helps us connect two independent clauses. Okay, jumping into the categories. First one is wordiness. When more than one answer choice is grammatically correct, shorter is better. Not the one that sounds the most erudite, the one that sounds like something you would read in a, in a, in a college level textbook. So let's look at this example. This is a classic and from a real ACT test. More creations appeared at several libraries and museums devoted to books and writing. That sounds fine. It gets all the information across. What a lot of students want to do is they want to choose B. And I'll read that one. A number of additional cultural institutions supporting intellectual endeavors dedicated to promoting 
kind of sounds awesome, kind of sounds smart, right? But the ACT doesn't reward that. Uh, no matter what your teacher might reward, they're gonna say A is correct, it has all the information you need, B and C are unnecessarily long. So how do you spot this? One, there's not gonna be any grammatical errors to single out. Uh, you're also gonna see a lot of synonyms. So, you know, in the, in the, in the example, we have several, a number of, quite a lot, um, libraries and museums, cultural institutions, that sort of thing. And again, most importantly, shorter answer is usually correct. All right, redundancy, very closely related, but this time they're gonna repeat specific languages or facts that appeared earlier in the text. So let's look at why these, these are difficult. It seems kind of obvious, but I'm gonna start in the second sentence of our example. So the boat docked on the Douro River in the country of Portugal, realizing Pollock stream. And the students will go to the answer choices. They'll read river, which is a river in Portugal, river in Portugal, river. And again, there's no grammatical error here, so you might just end up guessing. So in this case, um, A, B, and C all repeat the fact that Dora River is in Portugal. So we step back to the previous part of the sentence. Pollock's project sponsored the vessel's launch in Portugal. So D is correct. It does not repeat the information. This is one of the few questions that can require reading the sentences before and after. You might need some context. And your clue for that is, again, you don't see a grammatical error. Take a look around, see what else is there. Subject verb agreement. The trick is that a subject and its verb must either both be singular or both be plural. Our example question, one of my friends are really smart. Now, if you'll notice, you can see that A, B, and C are all plural, and D is the only singular answer. Well, it turns out the subject of this sentence is one. It's not friends. So one, and you can really read the sentence without saying of my friends. So it would say one is really smart. So you wouldn't say one are or one were or one have been. So then the answer is D. Um, for the answer choices, Look for questions that have answer choices where you have some plural versions of a verb, some singular versions of a verb, or it's helping verb, right? Is and are are also considered helping verbs in, um, in some instances. So just be mindful and that's gonna help you realize that subject verb agreement is what's being tested. You will also often see subject verb agreement tested you alongside of actually in the same question as verb tense. And I consistently think that subject verb agreement is an easier principle to address rather than verb tense, right? You know, especially for example, if you had tried to go into whether present tense or past tense is necessary, you would have gotten kind of stuck with are versus were um, or, right? But, you know, the entire time is, is the answer because it's the only singular answer. Down to the pro tips, verbs that end in S are usually singular. So she reads, but they read. He runs, but they run. So it's counterintuitive, obviously. Obviously it's opposite of nouns, right? Nouns, when they end in S, they're plural. Verbs tend to be the opposite. The second pro tip is that the subject of a sentence can never be in a prepositional phrase. We're not gonna really go into depth about prepositional phrases today, but of my friends is a prepositional phrase. Many prepositional phrases, maybe even most, are three words in length. So just keep an eye out for that. And you can also do your own research on prepositional phrases because being able to spot prepositional phrases is a key skill for this section, but it just happens to be outside of the scope of this webinar. But the subject and verb of a sentence will never be in a prepositional phrase. Lastly, there's a group of nouns called collective nouns. And you can see those examples there at the bottom. And they seem like they should be plural nouns, but they're actually singular. So you would say, my family is happy. The audience was loud, right? So it's singular. The committee is tired, right? So you're gonna be having and utilizing uh, singular verbs with those, with that group of collective nouns. Okay, now- Noun pronoun, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to stop. Noun that. pronoun agreement, no worries. A noun and its ensuing pronoun must either both be singular or plural. Okay, and the example is, I love wizards. They are awesome. Obviously, wizards are plural. There's more than one wizard. 
And so there's only uh, a plural answer and the answer is gonna be A. He, she, and it is all, are all, excuse me, singular. Um, and in terms of how to spot it, look closely at the answer choices. So again, there's a common theme here, which is the content of the answer choices is really going to help you to figure out what kind of grammatical principle is being tested. And in this case, if all of the answers uh, have pronouns in them, then it's probably going to be noun pronoun agreement. For our second noun pronoun slide, um, this is a second trick. Pronouns replace the noun that immediately precedes them. They must agree in number. Number meaning singular or plural. So if you have a singular pronoun, then trace, you know, trace back to the singular noun that most immediately precedes it. And that is going to be the noun that this pronoun is replacing. The same goes for plural. Plural pronouns rep replace, that's a mouthful, replace the most recent plural noun that comes before them. James loved his dog, Timmy, so much that he bought him a chew toy. Well, he should refer to Timmy because he is a singular pronoun and Timmy is the singular noun that comes right before he. But the dog obviously didn't buy a chum, the chew toy. James bought the chew toy. So then you, so any answer that uses he is gonna be wrong. So then the answer is B because you have to say James's name again to clarify that James is the one buying the chew toy. For the pro tip in this case, We've talked about prepositional phrases. You're also gonna hear us mention descriptive phrases throughout our session today. And those are usually just kind of phrases that are kind of wedged in the middle of a sentence. Oftentimes they're surrounded by commas or dashes and they, um, they are often put in between a noun and a pronoun to kind of confuse the student, all right? So in many cases, you can read a sentence without reading its descriptive or prepositional phrase and just really you know, ask yourself, what noun is this pronoun replacing? Okay, semicolons. So semicolons are the punctuation mark that have the, the period stacked on the comma. And they're a little bit challenging because we don't use them a lot, um, maybe a little bit in school, but they're just not super common. If I send a text to a friend, I'm typically not gonna have a semicolon in it. Um, but the rules turn out to be really simple. If you can replace a semicolon with a period, the semicolon works. So just like a period, you're gonna have, to, it has to be a self-contained complete thought on either side or an independent clause, that term we brought up earlier. So it turns out, you know, we have this in the pro tip there that when you're using process of elimination, you can actually look at the answers that are punctuated with a semicolon first, because it's just so easy to identify whether I had two complete thoughts on either side. So I'll read them one at a time with a big pause in between. The sun's rays no longer shine directly on Anchorage. The weather depressed res residents. Great, complete thought. And then C would be an, uh, an example of how they would, they would have an error on this test. So on Anchorage, the weather, depressed residents, depressed residents can't stand alone, so we can't have a period here. Don't let them intimidate you. They're actually quite easy. So for commas, trick number one is to use the pause test. And the pause test involves exaggerating a comma's pause to determine whether it belongs. Example, in the shadows of the city, she watches over us all. So the pause after shadows is weird and doesn't sound right, right? So this is one of the few cases where you can go by sound. For letter B, in the shadows of the city, she watches over us all. Um, that is, you know, like that is really natural. And then, uh, you know, like letter C has that comma after shadows, which is going to make it incorrect. So the pro tip is that once you realize the comma after shadows doesn't, doesn't work, doesn't flow well, then you can cross off answers A and C. Trick number two is that descriptive phrases, as I mentioned earlier, when they're in the middle of a sentence, they need either zero or two commas. 
one comma is never going to be correct for a descriptive phrase that's in the middle of a sentence. My mother, who lives in New York, is nice. That sounds pretty natural. My mother, who lives in New York, is nice. So notice that B and C both only have one comma, so they can be crossed off very easily. And then letter D fails the pause test. There's just way too many commas there. My mother, who lives in New York, is nice. It's pretty comically bad. So then the answer is going to be A. Great. OK, so commas, there's so much to commas. They, they merit two slides. Um, so trick number three, when combining two independent clauses with a comma, a fanboys is required. So fanboys are just a special class of conjunctions for, and, nor, but, or, yet. So we use fanboys to kind of help us remember which, uh, which conjunctions are allowable there. So for our example, I love waking up early. So I set my alarm each morning. We have a complete thought on either side of so. I love waking up early. I set my alarm each morning. So I want to look at C first because C is the one that probably sounds the best. I love waking up early. I set my alarm each morning because there's a pause on either side. But you want to think of it as a comma is basically too weak to hold two complete thoughts together. So B, I love waking up early, comma, so I set my alarm each morning, helps relate the two. And then trick number four, this isn't super common, but worth mentioning, so we want to be comprehensive here. Commas usually go between something called consecutive, or between consecutive adjectives, so adjectives that come right after the other. And there's a really simple test that you can use to determine whether commas belong there. So we have a correct example first. We walk down the long, narrow path. With the and test, we just read it with and in between. The long and narrow path. Well, we would say that. That sounds natural. So we would use a comma there. And then a counterexample. If I said three comma furry cats cuddled in my lap, that sounds terrible. It just doesn't make sense. It sounds unnatural. Um, so that's a really easy test. We, we don't have to remember any complex grammatical rules. For colons, I teach students to remember the acronym PEEL. Uh, the P stands for pause. So this is another place where you can use the pause test. And it's actually a longer pause for, for colons than for commas. As you can see from the emphasis example, the jury finally reached their verdict guilty, right? There's just a really long pause there. And then evidence, my cousin is so gross, colon. He always chews with his mouth open. so. When you state a claim, such as my cousin is so gross, and then you back it up with evidence or an example, a colon can be a really good way to connect them. Also notice that the colon is connecting two complete thoughts there, two independent clauses. So it's, it's similar to um, a period or a semicolon or a comma and a fanboys in that respect, and that a colon can be used to connect two independent clauses. And then the one that students are most familiar with are lists. I love fruits, colon, apples, oranges, and bananas. The, um, the SAT and ACT view colons as being repetitive with setup phrases like such as. So you would never say, I love fruits such as colon, right? So that's, the, uh, you know, like these two tests review such as and colons as being redundant with each other. And then the second pro tip as I discussed earlier, were that colons are a way to connect two complete thoughts alongside of semicolons and comma plus fanboys. Okay, dashes. So we purposely put this after, uh, uh, after we talked about commas and colons because they're actually sort of both of those in disguise. So we'll look at where dashes mimic colons first. Uh, example one, scientists recorded a wind speed of 231 miles per hour, one of the fastest ever recorded. So John just talked about the pause test, the really long pause test, and hopefully you could hear there when I did that long pause there. That sounds fine. And we have a complete thought before, which is really the only truly necessary rule when it comes to a colon. It has to have a complete thought before. So dash works here as well. Uh, the problem with A is you don't need those parentheses there. Um, and then C would 
fail that test of having a complete thought on either side. Um, all right, so the second trick, two dashes are grammatically identical to two commas. So my sister who lives in California is kind. To reiterate what we talked about with the commas, um, it just you have to be able to take that, that descriptive information out and the sentence still makes sense. So if I read my sister is kind, that's totally fine. Um, I like to think of dashes. Sometimes people ask, well, why do we even have a dash if they do exactly the same, th same thing as commas? They're just a little bit more dramatic. It's really more of a stylistic choice. But the ACT is never going to make you choose between two commas and two dashes. What they will do that can be kind of sneaky is look at answer choice B. They've correctly set off who lives in California, that descriptive phrase, but they're combining a comma and a dash, and that we cannot do. Dashes like to hang out together. Commas like to hang out together. Okay, apostrophes. So trick number one is just about identifying whether it's possessive or not. So if we switch the order and say of the, that'll tell us if it's correct. So in our example, the dog's paws were wet. So if I switch the order and I say paws of the dog, that conveys the correct meaning. So therefore it is correct. And then trick number two, this one's, this one's really important because in school, you probably saw a lot of complicated apostrophe rules on the ACT. It's really, really simple. If the possessor, we only care about the possessor is singular, the apostrophe goes before the S. And if the possessor is plural, that apostrophe goes after the S. So your first question, we're talking about being really systematic about these, is who or what is doing the possessing here? In our example, the chair's legs wobbled. So the chair is the possessor. Um, and since it's just one chair, we're going to select answer C. And then uh, our pro tip at the bottom, possessive pronouns don't need an apostrophe. So if you think about a word like hers or theirs, we don't have it written down here, but I guarantee if you wrote it down on a piece of paper, it looks a little bit tempting. Um, but because possessive pronouns are possessive in and of themselves, if you put an apostrophe there, it's, it's redundant. Misplace modifier, this is probably my favorite trick um, in, in the grammar section, actually on the entire test combined, and you'll see why. A descriptive phrase must be immediately followed by its subject. The example, thrilled by their discovery, the telescope helped the scientists see Pluto. That answer makes it seem as if the telescope was thrilled, but the telescope was not thrilled by the, by the discovery the scientists were. So immediately you can see that A and C are wrong and that B is correct because B is the only one that puts the scientists right after their discovery. As you can see from our, um, you know, like how to spot, oftentimes like sentences that start with descriptive phrases and then a comma after them will be misplaced modifier questions. There are other forms of misplaced modifiers, but this is the one that's most common is when you have that descriptive phrase at the, at the beginning of a sentence. Sometimes you'll see the descriptive phrase be underlined. Sometimes you'll see like this example where it's the, you know, the part of the sentence that follows the descriptive phrase is underlined. And then our pro tip is wrong answers can often be crossed off after reading their first word or two. Right. I mean, in this case, this can save you a lot of time to realize that as soon as you see the telescope, as soon as you see Pluto, the answer is going to be wrong. If you don't know that misplaced modifier is what's being tested in this question, it can be very difficult and very time consuming for you to try to figure it out. But if you can keep misplaced modifier in mind and and identify it and realize that, you know, that that's what's being tested, you're going to get the right answer in 10 seconds and be able to move on with confidence. Okay, parallel structure. So that's a fancy way of saying words and phrases that show up in pairs and lists must match. So in our example, Sarah loved reading and writing. That sounds good. Both reading and writing end in ing. And notice that they're, they're working together, right? Because Sarah loved two things. So we call those objects. She loves two things, reading and writing. And as you can see in the wrong answer choices, B and C, Sarah loved reading and to write, or Sarah loved reading books and wrote stories, 
just have mismatched endings here. There's not really a concrete reason why these are incorrect, um, other than it it really does sound more pleasing to the ear is kind of the, the best explanation I've heard of it. But whether we agree with it or not, this is what the SCT and ACT reward. Let's look at our second example, eat, drink, and be merry. So we have this example here just to be really clear that it can show up in sentences that have two words working together, or in this case, three. So the correct answer choice here is B, eat, drink, and be merry. All three of those are the same. And then C, the wrong answer choice, eat, drinking, and being merry. Uh, two of those have ing. And I think that's it. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, just like an additional tip is that 95% of the time that an answer has being in it, it's wrong. The SAT and ACT do love to use the word being in incorrect ways. And it's very, very rare. I think in all the tests that I reviewed, you know, we have about 30 SATs and 40 ACTs on file. I think I've only seen one right answer that had the word, you know, word being in it, whereas plenty of wrong answers had the word being in it. Transition words. Okay, there's a lot going on here, but if, if you can get more comfortable with transition words questions, there's a lot of them on both tests. So it's, it's an important category for sure. Trick one, read the clauses before and after the underlined transition word to see if they agree or disagree. Notice it says clauses. So in some cases it could be sentences. You could need to read the sentence before and after, or in some cases, the transition word will be in the middle of a sentence. So it's all in one sentence. You just read the independent clause before and after or the dependent clause before and after. Um, example one, I love pizza. However, I rarely ever eat it. Now, when you're reading the clauses before and after, avoid actually reading the underlying transition word. So I love pizza. I rarely ever eat it. Do those two statements agree or disagree? They clearly disagree. Because if be, be, you know, because I love pizza, well, I you know, if I really loved pizza a lot, then I would eat it all the time. So, uh, therefore, implies agreement. For example, implies agreement. However, is the only answer that implies disagreement. So then the answer is going to be A. That was a relatively straightforward question, and you will have a lot of that that level of difficulty, that level of ease on the test. But there, you know, there could easily be some transition words questions that are actually a little bit more complex. And that's where you want to use trick number two. Determine which C accurately describes the relationship between two surrounding clauses. So there are four C's that we know of here and that apply. Contradiction, confirmation, continuation, and causation. And you can see one example uh, word or phrase of each type of C. The second example is, I slept through my alarm. Additionally, I was late for school. It doesn't sound terrible because the two clauses do agree. I slept through my alarm. I was late for school. So we can cross off C because they obviously do not disagree. And it's down to A or B. Additionally, as you can see, is a continuation transition word. But therefore, is going to be the answer because sleeping through my alarm was the cause of me being late for school. Therefore, B is correct. So the four C's can really help you when you need to take your level of understanding of the relationship between the two causes, clauses, excuse me, to the next level. And then one tip that I love to tell students is, however, nonetheless, and nevertheless are all synonyms. So if you see like answer A is however, and answer B is nonetheless, then they're both going to be wrong because these tests are never, ever, ever going to test you on um, what is the difference between however and, um, and nonetheless. They're basically synonyms. Yeah, we can extend that to any, any synonyms for continuation also. So if you have um, additionally, in addition, they're not going to make you choose between those. So both have to be wrong. If they have, for example, for instance, and they do quite often offer two of those in one. So you can just consider that kind of a freebie. Logical comparisons. The trick is to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Um, I will explain what that means here. The example, the wages in SF are higher than the city of New York. 
you are comparing the wages to a city. That is a classic apples to oranges. And if you look at letter D, you'll see the same. The wages in SF are higher than New York. Again, comparing a wage or wages to a city. So A and D are gone because they make the apples to oranges mistake. Let's look at letters B and C. This is a noun pronoun agreement uh, category that's at play here. So you wanna find the noun that the pronoun is replacing and the noun is wages. Wages is plural, that is singular. So then, that's, so then B is incorrect. Those is correctly plural, just like wages is correctly plural. So then the answer is going to be C. In terms of how to identify logical comparison questions, um, look for comparative adjectives, higher, stronger, bigger, more. There are plenty, there's infinitely more reasons or um, you know, examples, excuse me. And then followed by than. So not then with an E, but than with an A. And that is going to be a strong sign that two entities are being compared. As you saw with the incorrect answer B above, noun pronoun agreement errors are gonna be found um, oftentimes in logical comparison questions. And then one big thing is that the ACT does not actually have logical comparison questions, the SAT does. So, and then just to kind of summarize, the most important thing to do is to identify clearly the two entities that are being compared. So in this example above, again, it was wages that were being compared in not San Francisco. And then for A and D, it was New York that was being compared. So really clearly identify, right? That comparative adjective and then the word than are gonna be a, a divider. They're gonna be a wedge. And at the beginning is gonna be the first entity. And then after, after it is gonna be the second entity and just really try to figure out what answer, you know, like which answer is doing the apples to apples comparison. Okay, commonly confused words. So we split these into two main categories, one being pronouns. Who versus whom? This is another one of those that is really difficult. In fact, I think a lot of English speakers have just given up on this one, quite frankly. Um, I've even seen teachers misuse it because we just, you know, we just don't really, don't really use whom a lot in modern English. It sounds pretty outdated, but the ACT will absolutely take advantage of this and try to try to test you on it. So the way to make this simpler is if you're familiar with subject and object pronouns, you can think of who as the subject, um, which if you're not, all we mean is the pronouns that would go at the beginning of a sentence. So I would say she walked down the street and then whom is the object. So that would come at the end of the sentence. Um, Paul went to or walked down the street with her her is the object pronoun. And a nice little trick you can do is if you can replace them with a subject pronoun who or whom or the object pronoun, you can tell which it should be. So our example, my mother who lives in New York is kind. Let's use the test. So would I say she lives in New York or would I say her lives in New York? Obviously she. So we would use who, the subject pronoun. And then example two, my mother whom I love very much is kind. Um, you would say, I love her very much, not I love she very much, right? So that one is a little bit tricky. You do kind of have to switch up the order sometimes, but you can tell I wouldn't say she I love very much, so you'll have a clear indication that you need to switch that order up a little bit. It actually makes sense why you have to do that, because we said it was an object pronoun. They typically go at the end, right? So I love her very much. Okay, it's versus it's. Always, always, always read IT apostrophe as it is. My elementary school taught me that ages ago. I have not stopped since. It's pretty annoying, but it does come in handy for the SAT and ACT. And then than versus than. Our trick there is that than is a comparison and then relates to time. So our first example, he needed more coffee than I did. We're comparing how much he needs coffee and how much I need coffee. And then example two, I will go shopping and then I'll drive home, then just implies a causal, a, a temporal relationship. All right, our second set of commonly confused words, affect versus effect. So affect 
I, I think this one's difficult because we just can't use our ear at all for it. Both of them sound fine in any context. Um, but one, the first one, affect with an A is a verb that indicates a cause or action, whereas effect is a noun that is typically the result. So if I said the, re the weather really affects me, um, so affects is the action here, and it's having, a, it's, it's having an influence on something, right? Versus the effect of climate change is real, where we're talking about the, the end result of climate change, right? All right, and then finally, site versus site. So site, C-I-T-E, means to reference something, like you would, you would cite your sources. And then a site, S-I-T-E, is a location like a construction site. And for both cases, really focus on the difference in part of speech for each one, right? So notice that affect and cite with a C are both verbs and effect and cite with an S are both nouns. Idioms, match a verb with its correct preposition. Example, awaiting for their table, the family grew impatient. Well, when you use the word awaiting, you don't need the preposition for. So A is going to be incorrect. Letter B, waiting their table. Um, it makes it sound like they were waiting on their dinner table to do something for them, right? So it's actually letter C, waiting for their dinner table. Um, in terms of why C is the right answer, this is one of those cases as uh, where it's okay to go by sound. So the pause test and idioms are essentially the two only places on the test where you really wanna go by sound. A lot of times you will see prepositions in the answer choices. Uh, you may also see different verbs in the answer choices. Usually it's kind of like two verbs that are being compared towards each other and their respective prepositions. In some cases, it'll just be one verb and then the only choice um, or like the only difference between the answer choices are the four different prepositions. Um, and then in terms of our pro tip, as I said, this is the only case where it's okay to go by sound. And then just heavily rely on being a native English speaker with, you know, like most of the time with idioms, either you know it or you don't. So spending a lot of time wondering, is it a waiting for, or, or is it waiting for, if you didn't know coming into the test, you're probably not gonna know on your way out of the test. So really just try to identify what question types are good question types to be spending a lot of time in trying to figure them out, but idioms is not going to be one of those. Yeah, that's a great point. That last point, because there's really no rhyme or reason for why I get on a bus, but I get in a train, right? <laughs> so no sense in sitting there trying to figure out which one is which. Word choice, cross out answers that are either too informal or incorrectly defined. Example, the sewer was really gross. Toxic, yucky, fantastic, right? So uh, the sewer probably wasn't fantastic, so that was incorrectly defined. And then gross and yucky are gonna obviously be informal, so the answer is gonna be B. This is loosely based off of an actual SAT question. Um, students love to guess that a category is word choice when they don't know what the category is. To avoid making this mistake, just realize that if you have answers with different words in each answer, and each answer is kind of short, right? Each answer has only one or two words in it, maybe three at the most, but usually one or two, and they're unique answers, then it's not going to be word choice. I consistently see students where the four answers are kind of on the longer side. They use, you know, the same words or like almost identical words in each answer, except maybe a few commas are different. So it's clearly a comma question and they will, you know, guess that it's word choice that's being tested. Well, that's not going to be right because the words have to be different. If the words are the same, then it's not going to be testing on word choice. So if the answers have, are really short and if they have unique different words in each one, then it's going to be word choice. Okay, so in conclusion, we can't state this enough. Being proficient in pairing each category um, with its corresponding technique is so, so important. Um, why is that? Well, they're testing a lot of different concepts um, that if you try to bring all the rules, all the tools you have in your toolkits can be really overwhelming. But if you know 
hey, this is a verb question. I know, you know, what do we have? Two tricks for verbs, right? And that's, so that's the only thing you need in your toolkit for those. It can really, really simplify this section. Um, you know, you can use additional resources like note cards or Quizlet to help you remember any of the rules, but we want to be really careful about that. The grammar rules are extremely specific to the SAT and ACT test. Uh, in fact, they might even be different from what your teacher wants you to use in class, um, but we just have to follow the rules that they reward. Um, try to grammar, categorize grammar questions before, during, or after practice, practice section, sections. I actually have my students do this um, quite regularly. And lastly, we just want to add that students make their biggest, fastest score increases by learning SAT and ACT grammar. A conversation I have a lot of with a lot of my students is, well, why do you want to start with the writing language section or the English section? I'm, I'm good at English. I, I'm good at writing. And, you know, I think I use pretty good grammar. And it's just, it's basically the lowest hanging fruit. It's so predictable. Every single ACT English section is almost exactly the same. Whereas we know that the math can vary quite widely in subject matter. So the grammar is the best place, as Robin said, to start your SAT and ACT prep. It's pretty rare. I would say only one out of five or 10 of my students does not actually start with SAT grammar. Um, you know, those are kind of rare cases. Most students, again, because the SAT and ACT grammar are presented differently, or is presented differently, excuse me, than the rest of the, then, you know, like the way it's done in schools, it's consistently a great place to start. So don't fret if this is initially your lowest section score, because again, it's going to be the easiest one to bring up. Note cards and quizlets aren't for everyone, but if I were in high school and I were studying for the SAT and ACT, I would use them just because I would put on one side, I would put the category, so verb tense, and then on the other side, I would put the trick, identify the tense of surrounding verbs. You don't need to memorize the techniques word for word, but you do want to have a good idea going into the test. Okay, yeah, if I do come across a comma question, I'm going to use the pause test. Or if I see a colon, I'm going to want to remember peel. Or if I see semicolons, I'm going to remember that they connect to independent clauses. And I personally myself like rote, like rote memorization. A lot of students don't. And if you don't like rote memorization, then that's totally fine. But just make sure that you're gonna be able to find resources out there that are going to help you realize how to categorize the questions. If you work with ESM, if you work with us and one of our tutors or mentors, and you do a practice English or writing section, and you get your score report back, you're gonna see the categories, the grammar categories on your score report. So make sure before you get your score report back, you're going through the questions either before you, you actually answer them or after you answer them and say, okay, this was a punctuation question with an emphasis on commas. This was a logical comparison. And then compare your guesses. I would write that down somewhere right next to the question, right next to your answer and then compare your guesses to the score report to see how well you're doing at correctly categorizing your grammar questions. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I thought this was a really sort of productive and constructive way. And feel free to watch this multiple times, right? The grammar's dense. We covered a lot of dense material today. So just do your best and, and really there's no substitute for repetition in terms of getting down how to match a technique with the proper category. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.